Uh, tonight, what we're going to do is Kevin's going to cover chapter number eight, user feedback. And then um, we'll see if we can get through that. Uh, Connor, or not Connor, but Kevin, if, if, you, uh, if you need more time to go into next week, just let me know. I know this chapter was a little bit longer. It than is. The other I ones. Mean, how am I going to get through this? <laughs> and, and that's okay, because I was looking at uploads and downloads, and uploads and downloads actually seems like it's fairly quick. So if you need time next week, too, that's great. Um, we can move it up into then. And then I think, because I haven't talked in a while, in a few weeks, I think it's probably my turn to take on a section. Um, if anybody wants to take on, you know, 10 or 11 dynamic UI or bookmarking, just let me know. Um, but those are the chapters after that, but, um, that's kind of the plan moving forward. So cool. Well, I think we should probably just start, uh, start moving on. So Kevin, I'll, uh, I'll let you have the floor. Okay. All right. Is my chapter eight user feedback showing up? Okay. My plan, um, let me start from scratch. You know, when I was going through this, uh, I love this chapter. I reference it all the time. And when I was uh, getting ready for the presentation, I was thinking today of how, you know, a shiny app is a communication tool. And these tools, these uh, functions in here are part of your toolbox to help communicate to your users and make the user experience better. I use validation all the time and I will dig deep into that and show you some what I think I'll go a little bit deeper than the book, not too deeper, but I'll just show you examples of how I use it all and why I use it. Um, and then uh, notification and progress bars. Um, I'll show you an app or, you know, we'll go through a little bit of waiter and I'll show you where I successfully used um, a waiter function. That's still a bit of a mystery to me <laughs> at times when I read the documentation and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't work for me for, for my apps as well. So let's get going with validation. Um, the first part um, talks about uh, the shiny feedback package, and that allows you to um, put validation into your inputs. And if you have ever developed an app for people or fellow employees, you know that your fellow we love them, but they will use your app in ways that you never imagined and <laughs> they will break things. So it is a great way to keep people in line and make their experience better. So they don't do something that they never imagined <laughs> would happen if they did something. So that's a great, um, it's a great tool to, if you're gonna have some inputs to make sure and you're gonna do computation to have some stop checks to make sure they don't use your app in ways that you didn't imagine. And what we were talking about yesterday, there's a, this really, Ryan, you really brought up <laughs> yesterday, it really got us going on the, the required function. And this is um, a really great um, tool because you don't want this on your app. And I am going to switch over to an example of, and this is where um, show you where uh, placing your rec function is really important. As I learned this a couple at least with validation of where you place it is really important. So I'm gonna run that. And then you see we have an error because it's expecting, Shiny is expecting. Hey Kevin. Yeah. We, we've still got your, uh, the book. Oh. Book outline. I think Zoom gets a little bit wonky with 
switching screens. I think sometimes you have to drag. There, yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you. So I've commented out um, the rec statements, but if we put that here, so now we have an error because it was expecting an input. And now that we put our rec function in there, save all of it. Now we don't have an error. But just a, a tidbit, you know, we talk about in Shiny where it's not as important to where you place items like in the scripting, but with these validation, it, it actually is. Because now if we put our, and this makes complete sense, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but if you get an error, play around with where you place your validation or rec function, because this won't work if you place it here at the end. So you still get that error. So where you place it matters a great deal. And, and what's the, so the intuition on the rec function is kind of like, hold up before running any of the subsequent code, hold up and make sure that you have everything you need first. Because otherwise, if you don't put in the rec function, the shiny app is going to basically like more or less kind of run, just run everything. Right? Yes, and it's yeah. going to ex try to think of a go back to this. Um, trying to think of an ex it makes sense it's like a, it tries a, to run yeah. yeah it's a shortcut and i'll show it to you in to me where the validation makes a little bit more sense because it's expecting an input and so it doesn't know and i'm drawing a blank on the example of that it's you're just kind of subverting a little bit to you know hold your horses we're expecting an output we just don't have it yet yeah okay because you know um one concept i wanted to talk about was with uh, validation is i have a lot of um, data coming in i have pre-surveys and post-surveys so i know i used to try to time putting the outputs with when they were going to enter data but that's hard to do so I was able to put validation in, validation in going, oh, please, uh, there's no data available yet. And I'll show this um, example. We'll talk about validation of your, your outputs. To me are, I try to make my apps dummy proof. So they're not gonna be able to do any inputs that I don't want them to do but it's the outputs that I need to put a lot of validation on. And so here is an example of some outputs. Let's see, or is this still an input? Let's see. This is there. I'm trying to remember this. Yeah. So that gives you a nice error message. When you um, do a mathematical uh, item that you're not allowed to do, and you could put a, but this is where you have more options. So you wouldn't want to necessarily limit their input right here. So that's where your output would be really important to do that validation. And if you look, where I'm highlighting right here, that's where you can just do it with a simple um, if statement, R script in there. If input X is less than zero or negative number, and the input is either a log or square root, you know, validate can't be a negative for this transformation. You know, I'm going to show you an example where I use it because this is an input, but I'll also show you an example of an output that, you know, I find the, the scripting a little bit more familiar. So, 
So right here, this is a, I use this with a reactive for a plot. If the source level, and that's a reactive data frame, if that's, if the end row is less than one, validate, sorry, no data available. And this is where I talk about, this is a communication tool because if the user sees that or a program manager sees that and they're expecting, they can get, they can ask their staff, where is that data? How come that hasn't been recorded yet? Or they can say, or point it out to me that we recorded that data. And then I realized there may be an issue in the pipeline. So like I said, it's a communication tool. And I have that, that works for plots too. Um, it works uh, for tables. If source level is less than one, validate. Um, sorry, no data available. And this helped me troubleshoot um, Tuesday morning. My app wasn't working right. And it was a little bit frustrating because uh, I couldn't see the error, the reactive value, but I knew something was wrong. So I took the validation off and then I saw what the issue was that I made a mistake in my function where I repeat, I mutated the wrong value. So it didn't realize what it was counting um, grants. So, you know, you had an error and um, like I said, it's a great communication tool for you and your users as well. Is there any questions? Well, Kevin, I was thinking in my mind with your current running app. So if we were to comment out, and I think that's your, uh, where is the valid output or is it input required? Uh, um, I think it's that one. If you were to comment out the if block and just let the text render, is it, what? what is the shiny error? It, it just comes back with an error message, right? Uh, uh, if you were to try to square root or, or do a log on a negative value, Let's see. What would I'm trying to think of what ours error would look like? So you want to do what? Uh, get a NAND. Okay. You just get a NAND then. All right. Yeah. So it, it, it's like dividing with zero, or, or you can't yeah. divide zero. Uh, you get the, the not applicable or not available. Um, so the, the if statement is allowing us to gracefully provide the user with a supplied value of our choice, not some arbitrary, I don't know what the service is telling me, uh, comment. You're, you're handling errors. The user is intended to break things. So you're able to expect those errors, provide them with a graceful failover. Uh, maybe they can email you with a screenshot and you'll know exactly what yeah. that is. Gotcha. And this isn't such a bad error because if my, if these run, the, the plotly will just be blank, which is awkward. But this, this table will bleed red and it'll give some cryptic message about, um, I'm trying to think of the message, but it's, it's ugly. It's not helpful and people it's not aesthetically pleasing at all. There was a comment way, 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 way back in the early weeks and weeks ago sessions where we were talking about reactive code and then pausing so the server isn't constantly overwhelming, right? Constantly refreshing every time you change something, you know, you get a, a refreshed output. And if the, if the tax on the server of calculating that projected output is fairly heavy, you can kind of step through it, right? You can block it. And, and I don't think the rec is necessarily that particular uh, step sequence, but I was thinking like if you had in your, in your current code, a for loop and somehow the for loop runs off into infinity, right? That's like stack overflow or, you know, you just start losing resources. Your the entire server comes crashing down around you. Um, the rec would be a pos or the, sorry, validation or, or um, rec statement would be an ability to prevent that trigger from happening if everything isn't satisfied. 
Am I thinking about this the right way? You know, possibly. I, I don't necessarily think you're wrong, but uh, you know, I'm thinking of more of it from an aesthetic communication point of view. I don't see for loops in R as often as other scripting languages. And that may be the packages that handle those uh, uh, calls in the background that we don't even get to witness and until we start opening up the hood. But I'm thinking the if you were to, I don't know, create your own logic using a particular package that may evoke a weird oddity or something. And that I'm always worried in a web service standpoint, uh, these are these are autonomous servers, right? You spin it up, you let it go, and it does its job for you know eons if it's if it's coded right. When it does go bad, though, it usually has a a detrimental effect on whatever business workflow your organization may have, and the uh, being able to either gracefully fail out of whatever error it's creating, giving some level of debugging back to the, uh, the developers so that they can figure out where exactly. Uh, section of the code or maybe, you know, a, 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 some level of breadcrumb that you would be like, ah, you know what, I, I know where that's at. Um, it may be going beyond this topic, but I'm thinking of how to use some of these validation steps in, in catching things. You know, I had, I really had some sloppy code in my reactives. I was, I was trying to hurl, do something in a hurry and when I was debugging it this morning, I was getting some sort of, or over the last two days, it was, when I put it, it looked fine, but when I selected a grant, the server just stopped, <laughs> said, yeah, we're done. And then when I looked at the logs, um, there was some memory went too high, <laughs> like all sorts of weird stuff. So I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I need to refactor this code. And then this morning I saw, I was trying to filter from my own reactive that wasn't done yet. <laughs> that was bad. That was, I go, what, what, I was, what was I doing? And um, I fixed that and that memory, I'm trying to think of what the, some memory push to the limit <laughs> there. So yeah, it's, but I don't think shine. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say it was a little. It was a dangerous, um, dangerous. But um, like at first glance, everything seemed to be working fine. And then when I selected an input, it just shut down. And I'm like, oh no, you gotta shut. Well, and and I and I'm 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 touching on a different subject in relation to just being able to manage web services. Shiny being an example of a web service where you limit your user's input and a good, very, very common use case for most users is uh, emails. So in most organizational enterprise grade email services, you're capped at 10 megs, right? You can't send an attachment greater than 10 megs. There's a reason for that. So that 10 megs is like a, I don't know, you, a, a, a clogged pipe or a, you know, a hairball in your drain that just locks up everything else because it's trying to clutch through this, this large file attachment. Um, the management of that application or the, the, the services of it, that's why you get those, you know, uh, uh, can't send attachment or, you know, no greater than this amount. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite stories is my own, it was my own cause and I didn't catch it early enough, was uh, managing, I think it was a it was either a Moodle server or it was a WordPress Drupal server, something. I tried to upload some image and the image file was larger than it needed to be. Or I, it was some code base that I was trying to, to integrate. And what it ended up being was a PHP line of the service that says, no, you can't do that. And you have to go in and, and modify that, that configuration to allow for that larger file size. Well, with every, every uh, change, there's obviously a, a cost benefit associated to that. Um, I think it was a Moodle service. It was, I was working with a contractor and we were trying to upload a package to our LMS and the size limit was exceeded, but I also had to come back and think, well, it's a one gig size. Like that's what the user is going to be streaming. And that's a very, fairly large uh, 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 file to, or module, right? This learning module. Um, is there a way to optimize it? Is there a way to slow it down? 
I apologize for, for extending into a topic not related to Shiny, but it is mm -hmm. in relation to what the service is doing. You have to be co uh, cognizant of what your code base is doing to the web server in managing processing of information. Web servers are extremely efficient and very, very, very good at their job until you just have weird, weird, weird things happen. Um, Kevin, I really like your statement at the very beginning. Users break everything. Um, you have to think before before the action actually happens. Yeah, you know, say even I've broken my own tools before. <laughs> so we have an app at work where if you it, before we put validation in, if you uploaded an Excel file, wiped out the database. Wiped out the database. Gone. <laughs> Go, we need to put a validation check on that because that's too easy to do. <laughs> we get to change it from an Excel to a CSV, wipes out the database. That was so, Kevin, on these, you were there's validation on the outputs, and then also you can do validations on the inputs as well, yes. right? So, yeah, <clears throat> so it's just a it's just a strategy, and whatever you decide to do to whether you check all the inputs or whether you let the inputs flow through and then take a look at the outputs that come and say, this, this doesn't work. Yeah, right. I forgot to show you the, this is the uh, input so we got. Let's see, let's see, is that the input? Is that the, yeah, so right here, that's when you can ensure that you have an even number or tell them, um, and that's a nice looking, and that's from shiny feedback, um, a nice aesthetic display for the user and clear yeah. about what needs to. So if you like the, I'm assuming the shiny feedback call has access to a function called feedback warning, which has the color of yellow and the, uh, Favicon, by the way, that's the term I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago. Favicon. Uh, so you're accessing your triangle with the, the exclamation point, or maybe if we zoomed in, it would maybe a question mark. I would assume that feedback warning, you have other options that you can specify to give you different levels of, uh, well, you, uh, concern. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, concern. There you go. trying to think i don't yeah feedback warning is probably you could probably let's put wonder if we put danger i think error was one of them you could also look here feedback feedback yeah feedback danger success warning are some of the options. I wasn't hijacking, I apologize. I no. sent a link in the chat because I wanted to show the team something that went back to uh, a couple of weeks ago um, that I, I wanted to, to reinforce. So what I, I, I Googled the shiny feedback CRAN package and our, uh, the, the link I'm taking you to is to their, their PDF uh, explaining. But if you, you look at page two, it's talking about the feedback options, the, the warning, the danger, uh, success, et cetera. What I'm wanting to focus the team's attention is like uh, there's a, a color code, right? That's called out a hexadecimal color code. Well, that's it's not RGB values. You're not dealing with you know MJYK. I think it is right magenta, whatever yellow and and whatever key, uh, K is. Uh, the hex values represent the displayed color of the, the app. And so this is a really good example when we were talking in CSS, SAS, and all the other type of, of languaging. This is actually a really good example of what that code would look like. Um, it's not exactly the same, but um, it would imply the same application. And this would be bad to have, it's an error, you know, please select an even number, but you have green and a check mark, but 
Yeah, you can mess with people. <laughs> I'm being very chatty tonight. Um, one of the things with Ryan's comment of data input, so databasing is actually a really, really big deal. And I believe in chapter nine with the download or, or uh, export possibilities, that might be part of that conversation. In databasing, you want to control your schema of expectation of, of data entry, because if you put something in that doesn't match, you want to error out. Otherwise, there's other workflow tasks that may be related to that database entry uh, that could be affected. So you're, you're, it's, there's a term for that, and I apologize, I'm losing my vocabulary, but it, it's, it's like referential integrity. When you enter a value, if it's, go ahead. Is it uh, maybe, is it normalizing? Uh, maybe, well, normalizing, I always implied as, as you've got a crappy database and you got to go in and kind of clean it up, right? Uh, do some Hoover vacuuming on it. No, um, but you're, you're implying the same concept, yes. So your, your uh, it's, the, it's the data type. It's, it's your character, your integer, your float, your ex you know, whatever uh, Boolean value that you're entering into the database. If you were to uh, allow a error into that data entry, there's actually a bigger problem that can be created other than just a problem in your database. Um, that's actually in most SQL injection problems. That's one of the ways that people try and uh, pwn a, a database is to uh, test your logic or test your, your, your boundaries of what you've allowed to enter. Um, Ryan, I was hoping to support your statement of the input validation. Uh, databasing was the first thought that came to mind in that, that uh, regard. Gotcha. Have you guys ever used um, any of these validation statements in your apps? Have you ever tried to use it? I haven't built enough apps to get to that point yet. <laughs> But, but I was impressed with all this kind of stuff and uh, just the ability to keep, to keep those kinds of controls around it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, I was super intimidated by it, and, but I found that it's, it's much better. It let me be able to get money for my apps, basically, when you can put that validation on there and you don't have these big, have to explain a big red error message or you know so it really professionalized it and like i said it's a such a great communication tool because something you know if one way or the other the data is not there maybe you haven't entered it yet or maybe it is and we have some other problem that we can look at but we it's communicating an, an issue so i want to take a step back to rec real quick. And um, my question is with REC is how does REC affect the, um, the graph in the background? Um, is it like, cause like that's what the server is doing, right? It's, it's creating the reactive graph. And then does it like just pause those reactives in a specific state? And then once like the valid inputs come in, or the inputs come in to change that, that is required by that rec, then it finishes the entire graph. Is that what it's doing? Because I think that was like kind of unclear with like, and I think maybe it would clear, clarify it for me a little bit more of like rec of like what it actually does to the reactive graph. Because if we go back to like chapter two, chapter two or chapter two or three. So three is like all about, hey, in the background, there's this graph that gets created. But then my question is, okay, now you're taking this, this rec function. Is that changing the reactive graph? Is it pausing the reactive graph? What is it doing? You know, my best guess without knowing the internals is that it's just pausing that particular output. That's my. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Well, because like I was sitting there, I was thinking, I was like, because because again, you know, the book talks about like, well, think about the reactive graph. Think about how, you know, your inputs and your outputs and, and how your server set up and how that influences the graph. And so I was trying to figure out 
where does rec fit into that piece? And I mean, it sounds like it just pauses it, right? Like it just pauses it. And then once it, you know, once it receives the, the correct, you know, inputs that you need to actually run that reactive, then it like finishes or changes the graph. Yeah. Cause I'm trying That's, to think I have an app that, okay. So it, and maybe this may help. I wish I could show it to you, but it shows the, so you have a, a statistical summary of pre and post surveys. So when it renders and it's, it's got data from this school year and last school year, but I default it to this school year. Okay, so that's the default of how it comes in. But I stop the post survey. If there's no data for post survey for this year, say, sorry, no data available, but it just still displays the pre surveys because it's got data for that for this year, this, the most current year coming in. And then if they want to switch it, so, you know, that's my best example is that it's stopping the post surveys from showing. It's saying, oh, you want to display post surveys. Well, there's no post surveys for this for this uh, school year, but we do have pre-surveys so we can display that, what we have. Mm. I don't know if that. <laughs> no, I, that, that kind of clears it up a little bit too, because that adds another layer of complexity to the graph, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and how rec modifies that graph, you know, especially in those cases where like, you do have a valid input being that you have the pre-survey object available to you mm -hmm. in the environment. But, you know, and it's waiting for that next, you know, that post survey data object to come in to finally display it. So I, I mean, you know, I guess I just keep going back to it like it pauses it right like it pauses that execution. And so I know I just keep going back to this idea of like, that was like the big thing in chapter three was like, hey, there's this graph that's made in the background. Now we're talking about like rec. Okay, how does that affect the graph? You know, because that's that's the one question I have, and maybe it's because we don't have enough tools to answer that question just yet. But it's that's just really kind of where I'm at. It's a really good question. I don't have the. I just know from no, a practical I, point. <laughs> well, I posted a, a link, and it's it's to a, a R Studio forum post on Shiny or or Shiny I shiny from our studio uh but if we scroll halfway down and I, I pasted the paragraph that i was trying to reference i believe what the post is telling us is that if you add a requirement function or a rec requirement sorry a, a rec function in your call it doesn't manipulate anything it doesn't change anything it literally just kills the process it, it, it just stops the process so as an example with uh kevin's uh when I had him comment out and I said, you know, if you don't use your if statement logic, if we were to put a rec in there and then we were to ask it to do this process, instead of coming back with an and value, um, the shiny server just wouldn't do anything, but you would definitely see it in the log data of that failure. And I guess that's the, the real key to this is that by using the rec function, and I'm, I, I continually use the word eloquent failure, uh, but it's not like it just falls on its face you end up closing the socket, closing the call, closing the calculation, nothing gets produced to the screen, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. So if we were to execute, uh, uh, do you remember, I think it was chapter four, when we were discussing the radio buttons, uh, being mm -hmm. able to, to trigger uh, uh, data input, like go ahead and now everything's filled in, go ahead and calculate. If you use that as an example, when we say that the process is killed, the uh, service is killed, the call is killed, it's not stopping the shiny server, it's not shop stopping the calculation, it might provide a means for us to pause and look at what we're entering, maybe if we add that validation step into it as well, numbers must be, you know, even value, et cetera, et cetera, cell must be filled, and then you hit the execute again, now it triggers that calculation call. And if everything is satisfied, then the requirement is met and the, the, the uh, graph is posted. Does that answer your question, Colin? Because I, well, I don't yeah. think it manipulates the table. I think it just kills the calculation altogether, the stack yeah. calculation. I, I think it's like drilling into another level. Because as I look at yeah. like the examples here, you can see it's like 
you know, it's in the reactive, you add the rec into the reactive. So it's, it's, yes. it's, it's like in that reactive element in the graph mm -hmm. and it's just okay. basically pausing that reactive producer, right. Or that reactive I, element because it's not going use, necessarily to an output yet. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I wouldn't use the word. Well, I wouldn't use the word pause. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use the word pause. I would literally just say it stops the oh, calculation. Sorry. So you're, you're never going to be able to render any garbage out to your user the re requirement is, is, you know, killing it. And that, that second point, or, or I, I, I don't know, it, nobody's sharing. I can, I can share real quick, Kevin, if you'd like, yeah. uh, I didn't want to uh, uh, hijack the discussion, but there's two bullet statements and it says it's the equivalent of a base stop. If not, uh, let me here, let's share screens and we'll go just this would to... mean, I, I'm going back to like the very first basic example on, on rec which was yeah. like, put your name in here. And if you just start typing out your name, R, Y, like it's gonna update, right? But if you put the rec in there, then it's not going to update until you get all the way done. It won't finish until your mask is complete, right? Say, I don't know, Ryan, if, if, if we can just use you and I as an example, we have four digit names, right? Four character names. Yeah. So if you have a mask set for that data input cell box and you start typing, you know, RYA, uh, the call is not going to finish until the requirement is complete, meaning that it's waiting for four characters yeah. of entry. But then, do, so that, does that mean that it's trying to calculate and killing it and, and killing every, like at every single letter, like R, oh, that didn't work kill why that didn't work kill a that didn't work kill and that finally works so now based on on what this page is telling us it would imply yes that's what is happening with a rec function so the reactive code is trying to process your data entry immediately right as soon as you have data cell entered reactive is going to automatically try to process it rec yeah. says wait a second you haven't completed your full mask we don't have four characters yet yeah. Right. We have to wait until that all four of those are, are, are entered. So the mouse listener, or sorry, it's, it's actually the box listener, the input cell of what that's doing. Every time that we enter another character, it calls on the rec. No, we're not satisfied yet. Hold on reactive. We're not going to, we're not going to process this yet uh, until the rec is satisfied. Then we'll let the reactive finish. So uh, Colin, I didn't want to uh, uh, misinterpret. Uh, I was I was wanting to correct the word pause. It's not really pausing anything. Um, you have to think as the CPU would in relation to a server and client handshake. So your JavaScript and HTML in the background, when you enter that data and it it sends that information to the server, server receives it, starts to process it. Rec on the server side says, well, hold up, wait, I'm not going to let you send anything yet. We haven't finished our, our job. The user hasn't finished their job. We haven't received all that data yet. That makes sense. So it's like, a, it's kind of like a gate almost. Yeah. Good. Gate. Yeah. That's a great way to say it. Yep. It's like a gate, right? And you need to have the key and the key is going to be provided by the user, the input yes. that the user is going to provide to us. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You, it, and, and, and I don't, I, I promised a couple of weeks ago, I would provide you a whole wealth of information surrounding the HTML logic, but um, you think of it as socketing, right? So this threading that occurs, this TCP IP stack that occurs and the function of a computer communicating to another device over that entire network, it's not happening from your device directly to the server it's actually more complicated because it has to go through all of these different network paths to get to its end goal. So when you send that message and it flies over the, the you know, wireways until it hits, you know, whatever server you're communicating to, and then sending that back, it's, it's microseconds. I realize that, or even possibly nanoseconds if you're on a fiber network, but even those threading will be cost both on the CPU and also on the client waiting to receive that information. Um, we live in a world now where the, the, the amount of processing power and network power, it's kind of a null, it's, it's, it's not even a concern. It just works. But uh, uh, if you're really starting to get into data manipulation, large quantity manipulation, um, call in your, uh, your uh, Google, uh, is it big stack? Is that the term? 
Oh, BigQuery. Or BigQuery, yeah, yeah. BigQuery, BigQuery. So if you upload a CSV file or upload a JSON file and you ask Google to process this, Google's going to charge you the quantity of money to, you know, uh, chug through your, your content. Well, I only want to send it an efficient data set. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be incurring some extra money. Uh, it's Again, it's probably, you know, ten thousandths of a cent uh, for a CPU flop, but it does add up over time. And, and yeah, if you're not optimized, you will end up spending a lot of money on cloud cloud services or just web services in general. Hmm. I'll stop sharing. I apologize, Kevin, for uh, jumping in. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Those become valuable. You know, we can all read. So it's the, that's, um, it's the going into deep is what makes it great. Um, I think I need to. Seven forty-two. Um, let's see. Let me go through notifications. Let me. I have to stop and then go to the right one. This is pretty basic. If you ask me, but uh, you know, you just put in. It's another way to communicate what's happening on the app. Uh, give you control. And I don't have any great use case examples, um, but you can always come up. None of my processes take usually take that long, or I use waiter. But here's an example. Of just running, and then once you select this button, that triggers. So long, they're low. The next part gives you some uh, ways to give people, you're telling people what kind of notification. Is it a message? Is it a warning? Or is it an error? So this adds to your toolbox. And the user can close it out. So those are some options for you as well. Notifications. I think I showed you that. Is there another? Show you some progress. Um, I wasn't overly impressed with this particular progress bar. Hard time seeing it when I ran it. Go. I guess that wasn't too bad. Generating a random number down below. That wasn't too bad. It was the progress bar up ahead. I don't know if I have it open. Uh, but it was the one at the top. But I did want to go into waiter a little bit. It was waitress. It's it waiter. Of, wait, the package is waiter, but yes. uh, I remember that that bar as well. It was just a tiny little line, and I'm watching yeah, yeah. what's going on, and that was the waitress version. But I, I didn't get to the waiter side. Let me just run. Yeah. Honest, I have mixed luck with. Um, the waiter package. Sometimes it works really well for me. Can do it, but I have a hard time. Oh, oops, I didn't load it up. I thought I did. Waitress not found. Huh. I guess I didn't run all of it. Oops, I no, stop it. Let me see if I can run it with this. This, this is another example. Go. And then that gives you a nice little spinner before the output. I'll share with you guys an example. 
well, let me pull up. This is from a Golem app. So this is the app UI. Well, but this simple script right here, right here was worked really well in an app that I had that shows maps and it took forever to render the maps. And so what I did is little purple hearts to show the user while the maps rendered and I'll sh share that app with you real quick. But so, and I guess I can open it up too. Stop sharing. Yes, so if we click on the state profile, you have these little hearts while these, this, while the maps draw, draw. So that was my most successful attempt with <laughs> Waiter. And that was pretty easy. But sometimes if you have an app that doesn't take that long to render, it goes a little too fast. Um, and I haven't had a great um, experience or best of luck manipulating the, um, the output or the timing where if it doesn't take that long to render, it's a little bit too much <laughs> flashing and things happening when it doesn't take that long to render. So it's not necessary. So you gotta use discretion. Hey, Kevin, I wanted to ask, Quickly on on the waiter side, uh, have you found any error with different browsers not rendering properly? Has any of your clients mentioned that at all? No, no. But that's good. Um, good thought consideration. Well, yeah, it's it's often Internet Explorer versions of Internet Explorer and and Edge. Those are your those are your banes of your existence. Um, <laughs> All of the other browsers of the world follow the WC3 consortium. Internet Explorer and Edge is willingly marching against the grain of all levels of normalcy. I thought Edge was supposed to put it back in line. Is that not the case? Well, Edge is, Edge is Microsoft's uh, comp competition with Chrome. Uh, yeah, it, it still has some embedded weirdness that it occurs. Um, and if you're on a Windows based computer, it, you can't ever seem to get away from it. Um, I permanently removed it or sorry, uh, prevented it from running on my computer just because I, I go to search something in your in your browser and automatically Bing pops up and Edge pops up and all these other things. <laughs> Do you want to be the primary browser? No, I told you to not open, but either way. I think, um, I don't know when it was, but I couldn't, I just switched to Linux, Pop! OS, and I haven't looked back, <laughs> dropped the Windows machine, said Correct. never, can't, can't deal. I was super excited about the, the modal dialogue. I had hadn't really thought about using those before. Um, this went into some uh, territory. I wasn't from, I would have, it wouldn't occur to me to have uh, users delete files off the, uh, off the server or <laughs> have them give them that option it wouldn't even occur to me. But I like the discussion on using the art of the, you know, make sure that they really want to do it. And I like copying the code up here that, you know, you could put this 
uh, script right up here and then your UI is down below, but it still works fine. I just wanted to test it. I was, I didn't know when I saw that example, I wasn't sure where to put, when I put it into my script, where to put it and it works just fine. Delete, um, let me open that up all the way. Delete all files. Oh, it's not gonna work. Come on. Huh. I got nothing working. Checking to see. Hopefully it didn't delete all your files. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. oh, it's always great when it works <laughs> when you're all by yourself. <laughs> I swear. It should pop up. Yeah, I was I was actually surprised it did work. <laughs> and there, there's not, I'm not my memory's not even running too high or anything. Huh. I don't know. Did you have multiple apps running at once? I mean, I can't even close out. No. It's deleting your files. <laughs> it's busy. I'm going to try it again. Let's try it again. Huh. Kevin's running RMRF on the background. Your, your entire oh. box is going to get. <laughs> Whack. Well, it's not even letting me select the buttons, so that's good. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I don't know. Oh, I don't believe anywhere in the textbook that I've read yet where we're referencing kind of the. Uh, I apologize, team, for coming back to this web service lo logic of of sys administration, but uh, user rights uh, uh, on a, a Windows box, Linux box, whatever server you're you're running, your user rights are. What is special about a Linux machine is you always run 755. 755 is read, write, execute for root user. Uh, uh, what is it? In the wheel command, it's read and write. And then in the, in the user output, it's read and write. Is that what 755 is? Anyway, if you, if you change those uh, credentials on that machine, that web server, uh, you may A, inadvertently grant access to an area you don't want to use. But uh, the second point, is that uh, uh, what's special about Linux versus a Windows environment is the use of a sim link. Now, a sim link is not a hyperlink. It's completely different. Uh, a sim link is a, another memory allocation pointing at the file where it's located. And what's special about this is you can give read, write, execute, or just read only access to a sensitive file in one area to your web socket or your web server. But then on the same token, the actual instructions that is only uh, uh, root of, uh, available, um, it's untouched by any sort of malware. It's, it's impossible to get to it. It doesn't actually exist. So this thought logic of wormhole, uh, Google Simlink, it's kind of a mind blowing kind of feature of, of a Unix operating system that's different from Windows. Windows doesn't have that ability, uh, or maybe I did stumble into it. There's a issue with mounting uh, from a web uh, Chrome service into a mounted hard drive because that could be potentially security and malware uh, associated. So uh, most services like Chrome won't allow you to access that. Uh, using Jupyter Notebooks, I was able to get around it using a sim link, dummying out the system because I did want to access it anyway. Right. Oh, there you go. So there it went. I just had to exit out of the screen share. So it was something to do with the screen share. So I was just super curious why that wouldn't work, but you know, see how I really liked how he talked about the aesthetics of making sure are you really want to do that, make sure it's in um, red, you know, the aesthetics and really thinking about the process of if you're going to allow someone to delete files or do something dangerous to really um, slow them down. Can you, um, can you go back to just the code on that? Yeah. I didn't quite get to this section in the book. And so I was curious to see. So like the, so deleting files, the title of that pop-up box. It's uh, right up top here. Okay. I see. So modal confirm. So do, at the very top, you, okay. So this is the very top of the code. This is even before the UI. 
modal confirm and modal dialogue. Are you sure you want to continue deleting files? Okay. So why would this come above the the UI? Is it just because it's not actually part of the UI itself? You know, I think it's just reading the um, the code. You can do a lot in Shiny. You can put stuff. You can put. Uh, when I was not a very savvy uh, Shiny user, I would put like read CSV file, you know, right above the UI. Uh -huh. So. It, it would do all this scripting that you, you, I've kind of learned not to do anymore um, in there, but before, but you can do a lot of, it shows that you can do a lot. Um, before you even get to the UI. Yeah, before yeah. you get to the UI. It's just reading it because it's in the same file. Makes sense. Okay. So That's, I, oh, I wasn't sure where to put that. You know, I wasn't sure where to put that. That was in the book. It's just kind of out there. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't sure, does this have to be in the UI? Is this part of the UI? I had the same question. Should it be in the server section? So I go, let me just see if I put it up top and see if it works. And um, it, it did. So, so you're creating the object modal confirm mm -hmm. before you even re ever, ever really need it. And then you call modal confirm at the time that you want to confirm that something's happening. So it's yeah. almost like you could do modal confirm. You could probably use this multiple times, right? That's yep. once for deleting files and once for, I don't know, installing a virus and once for whatever. <laughs> um, okay. And then you could probably also do another modal confirm that instead of saying deleting files, are you sure you want to continue? It's like you know, double check your password, something. And then you just call whichever ones you want and use them over and over again. Is that the yep. idea? Gotcha. So I have two thoughts here. The first thing, and I know we're coming up on time. We got about two minutes left. Um, with that modal outside of the UI, does that give us flexibility to make it modular, to put it in like an R file? And so you could have multiple, like you could have multiple different uh, modal like warning boxes and put it outside of that single file. I haven't done it, but I think you could. I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Because, I mean, you, you would assume that you would have different modals for different, yeah. you know, actions. And so, you know, you, you could clutter above the UI, you know, if you wanted to. But I'm just thinking that, you know, you could move that outside into a separate, like, you know, like an R file. And then it just reads in that modal and it's just available to you. So I know I'm hung up on this, but going back to the reactive graph, how does this influence the reactive graph? Does it change it? Does it make it an output? And I'm sorry if I'm getting hung up on this reactive graph, but it, it like it, you know, when we first started, it's like, hey, the whole foundation is based on this reactive graph. Where does this fit in? It's good questions. I, I don't have the answers, but yeah, it's funny. Know. It's like chapter three is all about the reactive graph, and then you never, never talk about it again. Well, we're going to come back to it when we come get to back. mastering yeah. reactivity. So <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, that those are the questions that I have is like, okay, yeah. Are we creating a new output now with this functionality or is this something completely different? That's like an edge case to the reactive graph. Is it something that we really shouldn't be worried about? You know, that's just the question that I had. Maybe I just need to post it to the Slack, but that's the question that I have reading the chapters is like, does this now become an output? You know, does it become a UI element just in the background? Yeah. So, yeah, put it in the Slack. Tan will respond in five minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the question I was going to ask is a follow up to to what you were saying, Colin, about making it modal and putting it somewhere else. Like, it seems like you would also might be interested in creating like a class, if I'm using that word right, that's like a modal class, and then you just keep using it. And you you pass the title and you pass the instructions and then it just keeps calling it back. So instead of having a, a different instance for every type of, of pop up that you wanted, you just have one and you change out some things. But I, I don't wonder know if you could also that. functionize it too, and that may be the same. Yeah, yeah. But you'd be doing a lot of typing too, so I don't I don't know. It depends. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it goes back to that, like, are you going to clutter up your environment with a bunch of 
Well, yeah. I mean, that just goes back to DRY. Why don't, don't repeat yourself. And so yeah. I wonder if that's what we're going to get into. Like dynamic UI is some elements like that. Maybe. So, but no, that's a great point. Dynamic UI is a lot of fun, but it gets, it gets crazy, but it's fun. <laughs> Cool. So um, I don't want to cut us off early. I mean, I can hang out for a little while longer, but we're at the, we're 702 right now, central time. So um, if anybody, uh, so next week I I'll take on, well, Kevin, we'll let you finish off if you have any more and then um, you're, you're good. Maybe okay, cool. People have questions. Maybe we can open it up for if people have questions or want to see something. Cool. And then, so I can take on chapter nine cause I haven't presented in a while. Um, so I'll pr present that chapter. If anybody's interested in taking dynamic UI or bookmarking, uh, let me know. We can go from there. I'll put on another call probably later in the week to see if anybody's, in anybody's interested. But other than that, uh, we'll see you guys later. Have a good night.